This is the Used Car Dealer Podcast with your hosts, Zach Klempf and Steve McClory. Hey, it's Zach here. And Steve McClory. And you're listening to the 13th episode of the Used Car Dealer Podcast. And we have a really special guest today, Dale Pollack, the founder of Viato. And I wanted to get things started with you, Dale, and ask you about your background and how you got the idea that led to Viato. And if you could give us that story at a high level, we'd love to hear it. Sure. Thank you. So I grew up in the automobile business. My father uh, was a dealer. So from a very young age, I was working around the dealership. I sold my first car when I was 16 and, uh, and really worked all through my high school and college year summers uh, at the dealership. And uh, when I graduated um, college with my undergraduate, I went to work full time with my father and uh, found that uh, being in my father's business, the one that he had established and built for many years, wasn't very gratifying for me. I wanted to do something on my own. So my father did a really wonderful thing on my behalf. He, uh, he sold out, uh, could have retired, but he put it all back on the line with me at a dealership that we bought together uh, in a suburb of Chicago, a Cadillac dealership. And that's really where I, I cut my teeth. Um, those were some tough years. There were some difficult uh, circumstances in the environment and in, in the economy environment. And Cadillac was just beginning uh, what turned out to be a terrible down cycle of their product. So we struggled. And, uh, and we really had to depend on used car operations. And one day my father came to me and he said, um, we need to cut back on the staff and I need you to run the used car operation. And at that time, I certainly knew how to sell cars, but I really didn't know anything about used car management. But uh, the, the, the worst problem was that uh, I had been and continue to suffer from a lifelong deterioration of my eyesight. And I said, Dad, I, I said, I, I can't even see the cars very well, let alone manage them. And he said something to me that uh, was very profound that would, many years later, chart the course of my professional life. And he says, you really, uh, you really don't need to see the cars, he said. What you need to understand is that it's all about the money. In fact, his exact, exact words were, as, were, it's about the money, honey. And I said, well, what do you mean it's about the money? And he said, well, um, if you think about vehicles as an investment, what you really need to focus on is just getting in them right. He says, you can depend on reliable people to describe them to you, but you really have to know what the right money is to get in. And then you have to understand they're, they're like investments. In order to get a good return, you got to flip them fast and do it often. So he charted me with that uh, economic construct to run the used car operation and unbeknownst to me, and, and largely also dependent because I couldn't make visual assessments of the vehicles, I didn't have gut instincts about, you know, how much it would sell for based on its looks. I, I ran that department very attuned to the financial side of the business. Well, fast forward the clock many years forward, and the internet came along, and it was eminently clear to me in the late 90s and early 2000s that the transparency that the internet was going to bring to the industry would uh, cause everybody eventually to be very much attuned to vehicle values and prices. And because I had operated that way out of necessity for the prior uh, decade, um, I saw the opportunity to uh, create a solution, a software solution that would uh, bring visibility to uh, pricing and values in a way that uh, never had previously existed. And it eventually spawned the beginning of uh, my Beato journey. Excellent. And tell me a little more about some of the challenges, because you, you ended up raising um, funding from a venture capital firm. But before that, there were a couple of challenges in kind of getting that initial version of Viato out there. What was that like? Well, when I originally... Uh, started out, it wasn't called the auto, it was called Empower Auto. And the philosophy of Empower Power Auto, consistent with my financial perspective of the industry, wasn't about 
pricing vehicles. It was about buying them for the right amount of money. And what we did in Empower Auto is we essentially gave a score to a used car manager or buyer uh, based on um, how much money they paid for the car. If, if they overpaid for the car, they got a lower score. If they bought it on the cheap, they got a higher score. And I quickly discovered that um, used car managers didn't want to be judged. Uh, and nor did they want to be judged, especially on something that they couldn't undo or couldn't change. And yet I knew that how right they owned the vehicle would ultimately have a lot to do with their uh, success, their, their outcomes with the vehicle. But it proved to be very difficult for those reasons to get people to, um, to, to buy the software. And in fact, it, it offended them. So um, I found myself sitting with dealer after dealer, showing them uh, based on what they paid for the vehicle uh, and, and how they currently had it priced, how absurd it was. And, um, and I would use sites like AutoTrader and Cars.com as a reference to show them that they were just priced way over the money because they owned it for way over the money. And one day the thought actually occurred to me that, you know what, uh, maybe instead of trying to get them to uh, buy the car better, maybe I should start from the other end and get them to price the car uh, better and it was difficult for any used car manager to argue when I would show them that their vehicle was priced $4,000 higher than the average price of similar cars on the Internet. Uh, they, they couldn't deny that. It wasn't my opinion versus their opinion. It was right there in front of their eyes. And, and equally as important, it was a decision, that pricing decision that they had originally made that was too high. It was a decision that they were capable of changing. So it, it, it was a significant pivot from coaching them initially on how to buy the car right to how to price it right, taking them from a decision that was my opinion versus their opinion to one that was uh, indisputable. And it was taking them from a situation where it was a decision they had already made that they couldn't change or undo to one that they could easily change or undo. So making that pivot fundamentally changed the uh, trajectory of of my software. And of course, I had to redevelop new software to be oriented towards pricing rather than buying. And uh, the business really began to take off uh, with that pivot. Well, I have a, a Dale Pollock story, if I could share with you for a minute there, uh, Dale, and for our listeners that I, I've told many times, if I may. Uh, it was 2014. I'm area vice president of sales at Dealer Track for the Western U.S., trying to get a hold of an old colleague of mine at Viado. I call the support line there. It's like 6.15 p.m. Central Time. You answered the phone. I couldn't believe it. Here's the founder, CEO, answering the support line calls. Um, the way that you've been able to stay close to your customers is, is absolutely amazing. I don't know how you do it. And, and so many, I'll always refer to you as, you know, Dale Pollock's a very close friend of mine. And I don't know how you do it, but very impressive. Well, thank you, Steve. And I still answer the phone. And uh, I on, on weekends and nights, when it rings too many times, it flips over to my phone. Um, and I think that just comes from growing up in the dealership. You know, when that telephone rings and no one's answering, you just pick it up. And, yeah. and the principles are no different uh, here. And, uh, and also, to tell you the truth, um, I've met a lot of uh, interesting people. Uh, answering that phone on weekends and at night and I'm talking to them when they're in a moment of, of need and, and very often desperation and uh, you know solving somebody's problem uh, particularly when they're in a great state of need is, is a really wonderful way to build relationships so I appreciate the fact that you recall that story and it it's very meaningful well, you, you, well. you really attract you know dealers with your knowledge and you're authentic we did some things right, and we had some luck, too, for sure. So, Dale, let me ask you this. What keeps you going and continuing to innovate with the auto, given all of the success that you've had in your entrepreneurial career? Yeah, this, uh, this is uh, a problem for me because it's just the way that I'm wired. Um, I, <laughs> um, and, and it might, quite frankly, have some to do with my lack of vision because sometimes I wonder at this point in my life, 
if I could play golf, if I could fly an airplane, drive a boat, um, race cars, uh, you know, maybe I'd be less, uh, maybe I'd be less, you know, less focused on uh, solving problems in the industry. I, I wonder about that. But not being able to do a lot of things that uh, normal sighted people might do with time, um, I, 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 I get my, uh, I, I guess I get my energy uh, fulfilled or, or my fire, you know, burns towards the direction of something that I can feel uh, some fulfillment and some producti- productivity or meaning from. And that's my work. So, um, I, you know, it, it's a really big industry and it's a really dynamic industry. A lot of stuff is changing and, and those make for great problems. And I, you know, I've, I've grown up in the business. Uh, I, I have a, an, an innate feel for it and I see the problems and, you know, many of the problems are ones that I feel, uh, or I, I see a path to solving. So it's, it's just kind of what I do. It's how I built, how I'm built and how I'm wired. And honestly, sometimes I wish I could wake up in the morning and not, uh, feel like I have to get out after it. It would be a nice feeling if I didn't, but it's just not who I am. So. I guess that's that's the best answer I have for you. It's just well, it probably out. feels good, you know, is helping people um, get you out of bed for sure. Well, we're in August. Used car inventory, you know, all time highs. You, you obviously see what's going on here in the marketplace. What kind of recommendations are you giving to dealers right now regarding the high prices of you know acquiring inventory from online auction to you know purchasing vehicles directly from consumers? I can't remember a time in my 40 some years in the industry where uh, I've had less certainty as to what the future holds. I, and I've, I've seen some pretty significant um, macro events happen in, in the industry across those 40 years. Um, but there's so much uncertainty right now that it's, it's very difficult to be prescriptive. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly to some of those questions you raised, but uh, let me just say, I, I think the first best advice that I could give a dealer uh, during these uncertain and, and volatile days that we're in now uh, is to stay very attuned to what is happening like on a daily basis, uh, because things are likely to change very suddenly, and you'd like not to be uh, caught short or long if, if you can avoid it. So, um, Okay, that said, to be clear, the wholesale market has been red hot. Um, and it's basically driven by supply and demand, as always is the case. I happen to think that there's good reason to believe that the market, uh, the wholesale market will, will ease uh, in the third and fourth quarter. I don't think it's like a bubble that's going to burst. Yeah, I think it's more like a bubble that uh, will likely deflate. However, there is a thesis that says that uh, before it deflates, it might even uh, it might even get stronger, and and that's largely because history shows us very clearly and without exceptions that the moment American consumers get money uh, in their pocket, they'll spend it, and often uh, on vehicles. So we're in for another round of uh, stimulus, I believe. And if uh, consumers behave consistent with what, the way they always behave when it's tax season or when April 15th of this year came and we got stimulus, they go out and buy cars. So even though the retail market seems to be softening and as is the wholesale market, uh, if we see another round of stimulus in the next 30, 45 days, retail demand could pick up again which will drive more dealers to auction and the difference this time around versus when they uh, went to auction in late April is that we have about half as many cars. So you could see uh, people chasing a smaller supply of these cars, which would raise prices. And if, and I stress, if you're willing to take that uh, thesis, it might even suggest that you go out and buy some cars now, perhaps more than, than you should otherwise think you should. But that's a gamble. That's a bet, and it's it's really not my nature to, uh, to 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 fall on that side of the bet. My basic nature is to say, run it for what it is today. 
And what it is today is is a slowing business. It's clear I'm watching it on a daily basis. The retail sales on a daily basis are, are falling off. And uh, fewer people are going to the auction, therefore. And it is, you know, it is the third quarter and it's followed by the fourth quarter. And we all know what tends to happen in the third and fourth quarter of the year. And, uh, you know, th- there there is a good case for really beginning to dial it down. Unfortunately, many dealers are still very heady from the unbelievable strength of the market in May, June, and July. And I fear that they've yet to realize that it's actually starting to slow. But again, as I stated, it could heat up again with stimulus. So this is why I say it's very uncertain and it's very volatile. So uh, I think that the need is ever present for dealers to really pay attention, not on a month by month basis or even a week by week basis, but you know, they should be tracking their rolling 30 day sales every day. And uh, if it begins to heat up or slow down, they'll have early warning and hopefully they'll adjust their inventories accordingly. Dale, I have a question for you. One challenge COVID-19 has brought on is accurate trade appraisals, whether done virtually or at the dealership. And most used car dealers, believe it or not, they don't have a software product like a Viato. What advice do you have for them? Why should they be using a tool like Viato, especially, you know, given the environment of the pandemic? Well, they don't have to have Viato as their tool, but it's hard for me to understand how any dealer is in the used car business today without a tool. And I, as I said, it doesn't have to be Viato. Viato is a very sophisticated high end tool that might be more than the average used car dealer really needs. Uh, but, but that's, you know, that's for them to assess, but they have to have some sort of a tool. Uh, otherwise it's just, you know, doing business like we did in the 1950s and sixties. Uh, and that doesn't work very, uh, effectively in a very transparent, efficient market. So, so first they should have a tool, but then the next question is, you know, how do you appraise a vehicle? And, and I think that there are two really important principles that are often overlooked. And the first principle is that uh, the appraisal process itself with the customer needs to be done with discipline, meaning that that you need to have a consistent, repeatable, intelligent process to appraise a vehicle. The inspection, the conditioning, the involvement of the customer in the process, these are really critical steps. So, so these essentially have very little to do with the tool, although some of the tools out there today uh, take, you know, guide the appraiser through the appropriate checklist of items. But, but, but getting a proper conditioning of the vehicle involving the customer uh, who, who owns the vehicle in that process is the first critical step. And, and then the, the second critical step or principle is should you appraise the vehicle uh, against the wholesale market value or the retail market value? Well, clearly if your intention is to wholesale the vehicle, then I would appraise it against wholesale benchmarks. But if you're going to retail the vehicle, the best way to know how to get in a vehicle is to first know how to get out of the vehicle. And today, the tools that are out there today show you what is the price that likely it's going to take to sell the vehicle. And once you know what it's going to take to get out of the vehicle, back up, back out, I should say, your minimum desired profit, back out your reconditioning expense or transportation expense, and derive the right amount to pay for the vehicle. So this is what I often refer to as the retail back approach. And if the vehicle is intended for retail, uh, I would uh, definitely recommend that the tool the dealer uses, the methodology that it incorporates is the retail back for retail vehicles. Wholesale vehicles, appraise them against wholesale benchmarks. And how are used car dealers, you know, leveraging Viato and Stockwave, you know, during this pandemic any differently with, you know, the wholesale market? The, the rage is, is acquiring vehicles because, you know, the, the supply is short and the demand has been strong. Again, I would caution you that that imbalance may not persist in the coming months as it has in the, in the past, but nevertheless, it's still, uh, it, it's still the, the primary concern of, of dealers today is the acquisition of inventory. 
And one of the tools that I created um, outside of the auto is a tool called StockWave, which is a tremendous time saver. A dealer can essentially uh, filter down an entire wholesale market across all auctions, not just Mannheim auctions, but all auctions. It can filter hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vehicles down to a short list of 10 or 20 that absolutely precisely match uh, what the dealer's current inventory requ requires. It could filter out all the vehicles except for the ones that are in the year range, the mileage range, and the likely uh, price range or wholesale acquisition range that the dealer is looking to fill. So in, unless you're using a tool like that, um, I think you're just going to spend uh, needless hours uh, searching for vehicles, many of which you won't have the ability to actually buy. So uh, I'm not trying to plug the Stockwave product, but it's proven to be a tremendous asset to any dealer, but particularly in an environment like this where everybody's looking for the same cars. So Dale, what are your thoughts on some of the online used car dealers like Carvana, for instance, their share price has skyrocketed during the pandemic. Vroom, you know, they recently had their IPO and now shift. They're looking to do a reverse merger and go public. What are your thoughts on some of these online used car dealerships? Well, it, it's difficult for me to speak with any intelligent authority on the, on the valuation. Um, I, I think I understand some of it. I think, number one, we're in a very hot stock market right now, which is a completely different discussion why that is. But, but these, are, these are retailers that I think are enjoying um, favor from investors uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, the, the, the COVID environment is playing uh, in their favor because they are uh, offering consumers vehicles in a much uh, less physical environment, you know, fewer human touch points. So I, I think COVID is, is favoring them in that respect. But I, I think the uh, favor that they're getting from investors more fundamentally goes to the fact that it's a more efficient selling model. Because one of the things that we all know is that margins are being compressed. And that compression will continue. So eventually, all dealers are going to have to find a way to sell and deliver vehicles um, with lower cost. And if you really stop and think about it, the biggest cost that dealers have in the traditional car selling model are people and property. And if you think about the Carvanas of the world, uh, they're selling vehicles on much less acreage because instead of expanding out, they're expanding up and air is free. And they're doing it in a way that has uh, many fewer required uh, people. So if you can remove the two large cost elements of land and people from vehicle sales, which is what they've done, um, I think it, it, it signals uh, the future for all car dealers. So it's, you know, I, I wouldn't be confused by the fact that they may not be making money right now. I think they could make money and probably a lot of money right now if they wanted to, but rather they're uh, taking the course of, uh, you know, being a land grab where they're expanding and they're building their brand and they're investing purposely and intentionally in areas that will serve them downstream. So I, I think what they're doing is actually uh, smart um, and, and ultimately it, it, it casts a die. I think that all the dealers are going to have to figure out how to follow. And, and to that end, COVID has shown the traditional dealer that they really can retail cars uh, with, with less dependency on their land and building and less dependency on, on, on people. So in, in that respect, I think COVID has had a silver lining in demonstrating to dealers opportunities for greater efficiencies. It's hard to get out. It's hard to get out of your property, really hard anytime soon. But, um, you know, eventually I, I think the, the square footage of the average dealership is going to have to shrink or margins are going to have to expand. And I don't think that's going to happen. Well, Dale, you've given some terrific advice uh, to our dealers, listeners out there. Anything additional you'd add as they battle through this pandemic climate and the rest of 2020? 
Well, um, as, as I think I already alluded, uh, stay on your toes. Uh, you can't get comfortable. You, you can't assume that uh, tomorrow is going to be like today. Uh, it might, but there are so many different external forces and ones that are relatively unnatural uh, to us in the car business, like sickness, infection rates, uh, government stimulus, and, and these are definite wild cards. So if there's ever a time to be especially vigilant about uh, tracking the pace of your business relative to the size of your inventory investment, I think this is one of the most critical disciplines uh, in, in to, always, but particularly in today's uncertain environment. Mm. Great. And Dale, was there anything that we didn't bring up or we didn't mention that you'd like to discuss? Um, we're in a very critical election year. And um, I think that people should think very carefully about where we're headed as a nation. And um, they should exercise their constitutional right to have a say in that future. They should, uh, they should definitely vote. And I think they should definitely not depend on social media to shape their views. Um, there are, contrary to what some would have you believe, I think there uh, is a very legitimate um, responsible media out there on, that reflect legitimate responsible views on, on both sides of the issues. But I, I think one of the, uh, one of the disturbing things is um, what some would have you believe that you can't or shouldn't depend on any media. Uh, clearly there are challenges with media, uh, but I think a, 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 uh, a, a, a discerning, intelligent, discriminating mind can filter out the obvious from uh, from the legitimate, from the, and and really make informed decisions and vote. Because I have a great concern about the future of our country, and it is our country that has allowed the automobile industry to be as great as it is, and I want it to continue to be great for a very long time. Well said, Dale. And both Steve and I, all of our listeners, we appreciate you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join the podcast today. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure, Zach and Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, this has been a real treat for the Selly Army out there and listeners. Thanks, Dale. And also, keep fighting the good fight out there. We'll see you on the next podcast.